Sometimes I build servers out of necessity and sometimes I build servers for fun. Yes, I know, hella nerdy, but this server falls somewhere in the middle. This is Amos or my automated media ingestion server. Mamus is continuously watching for any media that's plugged in, whether that be an SD card, USB drive, SSD, hard drive, or even DVDs and Blu-rays. And when it finds something, it automatically encodes the video into a different codec that makes it more suitable for editing or for media storage. And as you can see, it's also sitting in a less than professionally looking chassis, and that's because I designed and 3D printed this myself. No surprise there, obviously. And this is probably my favorite server that I've built in recent memory as it's so niche, but parts of it can be used by a more broad audience. And is it perfect? Absolutely not, as you can see. But how about we start from the beginning, which was why does this thing exist? So when it comes to media, I basically do two things. I edit and I store legally obtained videos to watch later via Plex. Those both have something in common. They benefit from encoding your media before using it. If you don't know what encoding is, it's basically taking the format that the video is already in and processing it into another format or codec. Different codecs serve different purposes, but in general, you're usually looking for one thing, efficiency getting the best quality out of the smallest size. This makes sense when you're storing all of that legally obtained media for your collection, or if you wanna create proxies for editing locally, or possibly sending over the internet to a remote editor. Now, if you're already thinking, Brett, they make programs that do that for you. What are you even doing then? I mean, yeah, there are tools that can do this for you, but I wanted the entire thing automated to where all I had to do was plug in any kind of media and have the machine encode it and send it to a network share to where I can just manually move it to where I want. And the first step of that was building an actual server that could do two things encode video, and have proper I.O. for reading all the media. And to be honest, that's pretty easy considering any machine from the last decade can encode video, and the only weird I.O. I would need is a DVD drive. I ended up going with two of these five and a quarter inch IC dock units since I'm just a huge fan of their products and conveniently, two five and a quarter inch bays stacked on top of each other is just barely enough to fit in a 2U chassis. One of them, the Tough Armor MB602 SPOB, lets me fit a slim optical drive as well as dual two and a half inch discs. The other, the FlexiDock MB095 SPB, also has dual two and a half inch disc slots as well as a three and a half inch slot, but the cool thing about this is that they're hot swappable. Just walk up and plug in your drive. And this was probably the most important part since my main way of recording footage is actually on a SATA SSD for my Ninja 5. So with this, I can just take that drive out and plug it right into my server and all of my footage is immediately encoded and saved to my NAS. Then if you have any three and a half inch drives laying around that you've been using to store media, then just pop that bad boy in and same thing, media gets encoded and saved off. Now here's the thing, you can just get these IC dock units and use them in any chassis that fits two five and a quarter inch bays, but I wanted something custom. Luckily, I already had a modular design created from another project that is a 2U rack mountable chassis that fits an ITX board and flex power supply. The rest of the space can be whatever you want and with a little bit of finesse, I was able to fit those two IC dock units in perfectly. Well, at that point, I had the IC dock units and I designed my own chassis, but I still needed the actual brains of the server. So I went to Micro Center to snag the rest of the parts and I may have made a little mistake. I'll explain that later. So of course we are at Micro Center and we need the heart of our system, meaning motherboard, processor, a cooler fan if necessary, RAM and some storage and something else in a bit, I'll, I'll talk about it. But you can either go motherboard first or you can go processor first. We're gonna go motherboard first because we have a, I think, wider range of processor options. What we need specifically for motherboard is ITX. And we are open to either Intel or AMD because in this case, we're building a media encoding server. And AMD has graciously started putting integrated graphics with media encoders on them, starting with their 7000 series. So we're open to either. And what we found here are two options and I really haven't decided honestly or which one I'm gonna go with. Um, we have the A620 here, which is the bottom tier for this chipset, but it supports the AM5 
chips for AMD. So 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 series. You get DDR5 RAM, but you get PCIe Gen 4, but you still get 2.5 gig networking here. And this is 150, but the other option is this guy. So this is the B650, which is the middle level. We get two NVMe slots instead of one. I mean, you're gonna get better uh, power distribution for if you want higher level chips or for better overclocking. With this, you're not getting any of that, but we don't need any of that. The thing is, this is only $20 more. So what do we do? Do we go 150 for this or do we go 170 for this even though we don't really need the upgrades? I think we do this. $20 more, who cares? $20 more, let's do it. So here is our wall of CPUs. And since we chose an AMD board, obviously we have to go with an AMD processor. We didn't go Intel this time. They do have fantastic integrated graphics, but AMD had much more affordable options for motherboards. So we went with that. And in this case, it's, it's fine. I think it'll be fine. I think AMD's internal graphics or Radeon graphics should be good enough for our transcoding needs. We'll see. But you could honestly still do software-based uh, encoding if you really wanted to. For AMD, I think it was a no-brainer. The 7600X integrated graphics, $140. Obviously, there are better processors, but they're all gonna have roughly the same internal graphics, which is what we primarily care about for our server. So I think this one will perform great, and it does not include a uh, cooler, as you can tell. So we're gonna have to go get one of those. Let's go. So we should be good with a mid-range air cooler, even a lower end air cooler. I actually just realized we're in a 2U chassis, so we do need something low profile. Who is this? Thermorite, low profile, is it AM5? AM4 and AM5 is the same amount? Is AM4 and AM5 same cooler mount? Neat, all right, so we can go with that. 56 bucks for this option. How much is this one? Is this not the same in a different box? No, we'll go with this, 56 bucks. Low profile, this should work perfectly. Okay, RAM. So we did go with a motherboard that supports DDR5. Processor, obviously it supports DDR5. So guess what we have to go with? DDR5, you guys are so smart. We need two sticks. Our RAM needs are very low. We could honestly get by with 16 gigs of the slowest speed. So we're gonna go ahead and just pick probably the best bang for your buck option here. I kind of don't want RGB, is that? Am I allowed to say that? That's a crazy deal. Crucial Pro, two 16 gig sticks, DDR5, 6400, cast latency 38, which looks to be good for DDR5. All right, that was easy. Okay, last but not least, storage. So for a boot drive, we're obviously gonna go with NVMe. What we do need is two SATA SSDs for our um, offloading storage. And we want to use SSDs for this specifically because if we're offloading from multiple sources at a time, we don't want to be bottlenecked. Um, theoretically, I guess you'd like to have NVMe for that. We could if we wanted to, but we have SATA um, storage options for our server. So that's what we're going to use. Now for NVMe, I've been using these inland drives and it is Micro Center's, like, I don't know what their affiliation with it's like their brand, but they're always so affordable and they work great. So I think that's just the no brainer. Look, look how cheap these are, dude. This is 34 bucks for 512. That's not the fastest, but again, that's okay. If we wanted to go up to the performance ones, you could go with one terabyte for $73. More than double the price, you're not gonna get any benefit for our use case. So honestly, we're just gonna go with the $34 one and be perfectly fine. Now, for SATA drives, we may just stick to the inland. They also have the enterprise line, which if you're writing a bunch of data to it extensively, then the enterprise, enterprise drives for most brands are rated for higher endurance. So you may wanna go with that, but it's up to you if you're gonna be using it extensively for years, go enterprise if you're not. Consumer is probably okay. But let's see what they're working with here. We don't need a lot because we're just offloading this to encode it and then we're moving it to our mass storage. So we don't need a lot. We could go with two of the 500 gigabyte ones, the enterprise lines, which would be cool. That does sound like a good option. Let's do that. Two enterprise SATA SSDs and a 512 NVMe. Total 35 plus 
was two times 70. 140, 165, math. Okay, we need 3D print filament for our server. And you guys probably already know what color it is because it's probably in the thumbnail and you've probably already seen it, but here I am choosing what color we want it to be. And I don't want to just go with boring old black, but I don't want it to be too crazy. So what do we go with? Like a blue? I think a light blue would be cool. It's kind of like the black icy dock bays and power supply, matte PLA, like something like this maybe? Like that, would that be cool? Well, it looks good in a thumbnail. That's all that matters, right? I, I still have some of the unicorn swirl from the pie case, but that would be too, that's too exotic. I think blue would be cool. Let's do this. Let's go matte blue. All right, that was easy. Blue, blue server, let's do it. All right, so after getting our parts, it was time to put everything together, which went okay. But for the most part, this design is pretty decent. It uses M3 heat tap connectors and some Gorilla Glue to put it all together. And then the IC dock units slide right in. I'm using this Flex ATX power supply since they just work well in this form factor, and also this cool little power button. Other than that, this goes together like a regular computer. The one complaint I do have about this setup is that it can only fit an ITX board, and ITX boards aren't known for having a lot of SATA ports. This one has two. We need six. Originally, I was using a PCIe card to give me four more ports, but this kind of sucked since it used my only PCIe slot. But then I realized I had two M.2 slots, meaning I could just move my NVMe drive to the other one on the back, then install an M.2 to SATA card, giving me the SATA expansion without wasting a PCIe slot. This allowed me to use this single slot half-height Intel Arc A310 graphics card, and I did a video on that probably over a year ago, and basically this is an encoding beast, and you can usually get it for under $100. But hold on, didn't I buy a processor with integrated graphics and dedicated encoders? Yep, so what's the problem? Well, here is where I messed up. I assumed that since the iGPU on this Ryzen processor is Radeon based, that it would be mature enough to work in Linux, and well, it does. I got the drivers installed with little issue, but what I didn't expect is that FFmpeg and specifically Handbrake wouldn't support the hardware encoders in Linux without manually compiling it. And even still, that doesn't seem to work very well. I mean, I tried, but I just couldn't get FFmpeg to play nicely with AMD's encoders. Oh, and by the way, I'm using Ubuntu and FFmpeg is the program that does the encoding. And Handbrake is basically just a wrapper application that also uses FFmpeg. But yeah, I had a few options at this point. A, I could have switched to Windows, which has more mature drivers and support for these encoders. B, I could have just said, screw the hardware encoders and rely on software encoding. Or C, I could slap an Intel or NVIDIA GPU in here to use those hardware encoders. At this point, it's pretty obvious what I did, but I was really close to option B and just relying on software encoding, which isn't bad, but when I realized this motherboard has two NVMe slots and the Intel card was just sitting on the shelf, I had to go that route. Now for the software side of things. It's all done in Python with some help from my AI assistant. For the most part, it's just scanning common mount points every few seconds, then when it finds a candidate, it then scans all the directories in there for video files. If it finds something, it'll check to see if we already encoded that one, and if not, then it'll use the Handbrake CLI or FFmpeg to encode it. I have a few profiles set up for if I'm encoding a DVD or Blu-ray for better quality, making smaller files to send to an editor, or for making proxies to edit locally and an easy to edit codec. I know it may seem silly to use both Handbrake CLI and FFmpeg, but they're both good at different things. The Handbrake CLI is really good at handling protected DVDs and FFmpeg supports DNX HR, which is great for making easy to edit proxies. So FFmpeg gets used for regular video files and the Handbrake CLI gets used for DVDs and Blu-rays. And maybe that's silly, I don't care. Oh, and Blu-ray discs need to be ripped before Handbrake can handle them, so we need another program called Make MKV. So if we find a Blu-ray disc, then first rips to a directory, then passes that to Handbrake, which does take a pretty long time, but what can you do? I actually went ahead and made it a multi-threaded process, so it will process multiple files in parallel, and in the config, you can set the max amount of runs you want it to handle. Then upon a successful encode job, the file is moved over to a final destination, which in my case is a mounted SMB share on my NAS. 
And while this code isn't what I would consider production ready, it works great for my use case. I have a link to the GitHub down in the description if you want to use it or more realistically improve it. Like, do you guys want to see more of a coding deep dive? I legit don't know how much to talk about it here because I don't want to bore you to death. How about I just do a live demo of it so you can see it in real time? All right, so let's bust this out. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to take this SSD that I use in my Ninja 5 uh, to do some B-roll. And I just did some B-roll. It should have uh, like four or five files on here. And this is what we are seeing. So I'm going to go ahead and start up the code. So you can see it running. It has detected my Blu-ray disc that I have in here, and you can see that it skipped it because it has already been encoded. But let's go ahead and insert this, and I think it runs every 30 seconds. So when we do this, it should find the files after the next one. And then once it finds it, I'm gonna open up these two directories here. It should move the files on here after it encodes them uh, to the local directory on the left, and then on a successful encode, it'll move them to the final destination, which is my mounted point to my NAS. Bada bing, bada boom, you can see it encoding. You can see it finished. And then once it finished, it moved them over. And that was very fast, right? So we have three files that were encoded. They are only three-ish megabytes. And if you look at those, those are recorded as 4K ProRes. And they are encoded down into H.265 720p. So if you want to transfer these to an editor, you want real small files for them to work with, this is what that does. So now that I've been using this for a bit, let's talk about what I like about it and what I messed up on. Overall, it's a great machine. The fact that I can just plug in any storage from recording into here and get automatically created consistent proxies is awesome. No more worrying about having a timeline with mixed codecs and resolutions. It's great. The DVD feature is also cool, but a bit less useful for me since I don't really have a large DVD collection, but I figured if I was doing a true media ingestion server, then I kind of had to put that feature in. I'd say my biggest mistake is honestly going with AMD, which is annoying because it's a great chip and the price was fantastic, but for what I wanted to do, it just didn't play nicely with Linux. Going with an Intel system would let me use the built-in QuickSync encoders and not have to rely on adding a GPU. This means that I'd have a PCIe slot available for high-speed networking, more NVMe storage, or I don't know, maybe I would have just used a GPU anyway. As for the design of the system, I really need to figure out a better way to attach these three pieces together. I'm thinking some kind of dovetail clip with glue would be easier and less brittle, but I mean, it works. And for the software, there are so many little things that I could have improved on. Not using two different encoding tools, having cleaner configurations, the ability to maintain custom profiles, and even containerizing it. But I'm a lazy piece of shit, so I probably won't get to that, but who knows. Overall though, I love this thing. I think it's a fun combination of unique hardware, custom design, and software development that breaks the monotony of generic NAS reviews and talking about Ubiquiti hardware for the millionth time. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but only if they're nice. If you like this video, then drop a like and subscribe for more fun projects. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my 2U media server that's way more professionally done than this one. You guys are a three-piece suit. And if you're still watching, you're an 80 plus bronze power supply. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.